DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined once again by Mike Aquilina, who is the author of more than 40 books on Catholic history, doctrine, and devotion. The Fathers of the Church and the Mass of the Early Christians are considered standard textbooks in universities and seminaries. Mike has co-hosted nine series on the Eternal Word television network and has hosted two documentaries on early Christianity. He is a frequent guest on Catholic Radio. Mike is the Vice President of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. With Mike Aquilina, we go inside the pages of The World of Ben-Hur, published by Sophia Institute Press. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. It's good to be back. The world of Ben-Hur. I think this is a wonderful way to evangelize, isn't it? I mean, in a really a different type of way. Uh, absolutely. Ben-Hur is a fascinating phenomenon to me. The, the novel first appeared in 1880, so a long time ago. We're talking 136 years ago <laughs> the novel appeared, and it was a blockbuster bestseller. It was such a huge bestseller that it was not matched until decades later. You know, when Gone with the Wind appeared, it was almost a half a century there. It just dominated the scene in fiction. Uh, it was a Broadway play, and as a Broadway play, it was a huge hit. It was a s silent film twice, and each time it was a silent film, it really seized the imagination of audiences. And then, of course, there was the, the version of it that we grew up with, the 1959 film with Charlton Heston, which was another blockbuster hit. It, now, since then, it's been a television miniseries. It's been remade as a feature film. It's been recast as, a, as an animated feature. And every time it's out, it really seizes the, the attention and the imagination of large audiences. So we know that this is a story that's effective, that's moving, that, that really draws people in. And why is that? Well, because it's been her and the subtitle is A Tale of the Christ. You know, Jesus Christ is not uh, the pro protagonist of the novel by any stretch, but the novel ends up being about Christ in a mysterious way. Uh, and I don't want to give, give away the, the plot or the ending or anything like that, but the novel is genuinely about Christ. And there are good reasons for that, because the novel itself has an interesting backstory. It is a wonderful example of how an author may not have set out to do the Catholic or the Christian novel. He started out to do a really good story, and somehow, I mean, in that great mystery, God busted it in there, didn't he? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the, the, the book, Ben-Hur, was written by General Lew Wallace, who was who was a major figure in the Civil War. Uh, he was he he uh, he he played a, a decisive role in in a number of battles, and I won't go into that. That now that would just be a distraction. Later on, he became the uh, territorial governor in New Mexico. He also practiced law, but he found administrative work to be very boring, and he started writing novels as a diversion. He was very much a history buff, and he liked to write historical novels, historical fiction. And uh, and he wrote one about the uh, Spanish conquest, about the Aztec. He wanted to write a novel about Christian origins. Now, the interesting thing is that General Wallace was not a believer. He was not a Christian in, in, any, in any sense, by any stretch. He got into a long conversation with the famous atheist, uh, Robert Ingersoll on the train, and at the end of it, you know, Wallace determined he was going to write a novel to kind of talk Christians out of their delusions about the divinity of Jesus. He was going to write a novel that showed them that Jesus was just an ordinary guy. And so he set out to write that novel. But Lou Wallace didn't do things by half measure. He really really threw himself into the research, the historical research, serious historical research for this novel. Uh, and he traveled all over. He tried to read all the books he could. And of course, at that time, there was no automobile travel. There was no internet. There was no interlibrary loan. So if he wanted to use major research libraries, he would have to get on a train and go to these major cities. So he traveled to Boston. He traveled to Washington. And he poured over these books just for example, about classical warfare 
and how the Romans fought their battles, about sea warfare, and how the ships actually worked. And he would spend days looking at the mechanism of the oars, you know, and trying to understand, you know, how that functioned uh, in, in, in propelling a boat forward and how it functioned in times of battle. So he was a serious researcher, very serious researcher. Uh, now, uh, an interesting thing happened uh, along the way to, uh, to his novel. The more research he did, the more it seemed to him that the Christians were right about Jesus that he was truly the Christ, that he was truly the Son of God, that he was divine. And he came to believe as a Christian by the end of the writing of the novel. And I, the novel itself kind of reflects that conversion process. What's interesting to me, Chris, is how well it's communicated that process and how well it's guided other people along that process. Every time Ben-Hur appears on the cultural scene as a book, as a play, as a silent movie, a, a talkie, the, as an animated feature, it works conversions because it gives people an imaginative entry into the times of Jesus Christ. It's an exciting thing, obviously a life-changing thing for Lou Wallace. Uh, I'm hoping now that Ben Hur is coming out in a in a new version for the big screen that it could be it could be a moment of conversion for a lot more people. Boy, there's the word conversion uh, that turning towards Christ. That it's a journey, isn't it? It is. It is. And it's a novel about conversion. Uh, I, again, I don't want to give away the plot. I don't want to, I don't want, uh, to, uh, to have any spoilers here. Uh, but it's a novel that's about conversion, and it affects conversion. Uh, Christianity is different from all other world religions in that it's utterly dependent upon history. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became man in a particular time, and you can spot it on the timeline, um, and he became man in a particular place, and you can find it on a map. You can even go there if you want, and you can walk in his footsteps. Well, Ben-Hur is a, a real attempt to take people by the hand and and uh, get into a time machine, walk in that land, walk in the footsteps of Jesus, follow after him, and know what it was like to follow his, his career as a rabbi, to come to the realization uh, that he's the Messiah, as, as so many of those original disciples did, and, uh, and, and, and help people through that. Ben-Hur has probably been more effective at this than any other work of fiction down through history. I, I can't think of a rival for it. It really depicts, in a strong way, the atmosphere, the world, at that time in the Middle East. And it does so by means of certain iconic um, uh, cinematic moments. Uh, you know, people remember that rowing scene you know, where, where all of those men are moving the, the boat forward just by the strength of their arms. So that's a, an iconic scene, uh, and it conveys something about the world of Jesus, the world of Ben-Hur. The other iconic scene, of course, is the chariot race, and that too conveys something about that world. And then there's a scene in a le leper cult that also tells us something about that world and about the difference that Jesus made in that world. All of these moments are, are so important because they give us, again, an imaginative entry into that world to see what it was like before Jesus and to see what it was like after Jesus, to see the difference that Jesus made, the effects of the Christian revolution. Do you think, Mike, too, the appeal of Ben-Hur is that, again, it, it is not as so overtly about Jesus Christ, but what occurs in the challenge of opening your heart to him? I mean, what it's like, especially at those that that time in history, for those who would be transformed by him, the challenge of that. You know, absolutely. As I said before, it's a tale of the Christ. It's also a conversion story. the The, the story is about Judah Ben Hur. And uh, Judah Ben-Hur undergoes a lot during this. He, he has a, a somewhat privileged life, even though he's, he's living under occupying powers. Uh, he, he experiences betrayal. 
he experiences a humiliation. He's he he goes from uh, from a, a comfortable life to a very very uncomfortable life, uh, uh, where he's not expected to live long, and uh, and he manages to survive by um, almost almost on the um, almost on the strength of his desire for revenge, and um, and then an interesting thing happens. You know, God works with that that momentum. God takes that momentum that's very negative and he turns it around and uh, and he propels a life forward as strongly as, as grace can take it and uh, and takes it in the direction of Jesus Christ. And uh, of course, Judah has an encounter with Jesus Christ and it's transforming. What I love about the book, Mike, is that it's not necessarily a, a an accompaniment book for the film, though it could be used for that. It's more than that. It really, you give us such a historical perspective to the, the atmosphere of the world at the time, but also of the hearts of those at the time. Well, I want people to know the difference that Christianity made. You know, we, we take so much for granted, Chris. We have all these wonderful values, and we think they're secular values. You know, we believe in human dignity. We believe in human equality. We believe in human rights. We believe in the rights of women, the rights of children. Uh, we're against slavery as an institution. You know, we have all of these things going on, and, and we, we really have no idea where these things came from. They were all part and parcel of the Christian Revolution, and they're utterly dependent on the Christian Revolution. You won't find these realities, you won't find these values anywhere in the Greco-Roman world, in the pagan world, in the Babylonian world. These values set Jews and Christians apart from everybody else, and, 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 and it all turned on certain ideas about creation and the special creation of the human person. It all turned on the idea of redemption and the value that God God placed on um, on earthly life uh, by taking it on himself. Until then, there was no talk about just war. There was no talk about battlefield morality. Well, if you if you were on the battlefield, hey, all was fair in war. And uh, and then if you defeated another nation in battle, if you defeated a people, this was the your enemy. You humiliated your enemy. There was no martial plan for the enemies of Rome. Rome went in and they they took advantage of the women. Uh, they enslaved the children. They killed the men. And if they were really angry, they salted your fields so that your fields would never be be um, be fertile again. Mm -hmm. So it was a terrible, brutal world. Uh, and uh, what I what I appreciate about about the story of Ben-Hur is that it really captures the, the essence of that pre-Christian world in its brutality. Uh, you know, I'm thinking especially of those scenes with, with, the, um, uh, with the, the enslaved men, uh, the scene with the, uh, the, the chariot race, and then uh, the, the scene with the leper colony. It really captures powerful images of what the world was like before Christ, and then it moves us into the world as we know it after Christ. It concerns me, Chris, because I almost feel that we're entering a post-Christian age as the influence of the church recedes into a kind of horizon. I, I worry that, um, that we probably can't hold on to these values we cherish, human equality, human dignity, uh, and, and everything that goes with these ideas. A time of great challenge for us and for so many around the world. Maybe that's one of the reasons why this is such a powerful uh, work. Yeah, uh, you know that that's absolutely right. Ben Hur is set in a in a time like that, a time of crisis for the world, a turning point. You know, people were excited at the time of our Lord because Rome had had conquered so much of the known world, uh, much more than anyone before had been able to do, and Rome had imposed a certain idea of order. It almost had the appearance of, of world peace, because Rome had suppressed piracy on the high seas. Rome had uh, brought running water into a lot of cities and uh, kind of a, a sewer system to take contagion out of the cities. It was kind of an exciting time. People were looking to the Caesars 
as uh, as as possible saviors. You know, they can they can bring us prosperity. They can bring us health and wealth, and they can make things good for us. They can realize our dreams. You know, now from our vantage point, we know that the Caesars were incapable of doing that. But there was a, a level of excitement that all of these new new things, these new technologies, like the movement of water, for example, uh, and uh, improved travel because of the roads and the discovery of the trade winds. Uh, all of these things could could make a better life for everyone. Um, and uh, and we live in times of excitement like that, too. People have great expectations today. They need to be channeled in the right direction. Um, and, uh, and of course, that's what you're doing uh, with your podcasts. And I appreciate what you're doing. You're using the technology. You're using the, the very the very means, uh, the very motives for our excitement uh, to bring people to a to um, to the ultimate end, to the good end, uh, knowledge of Jesus Christ and friendship with Jesus Christ. Boy, that's the key, isn't it, Mike? Because you know, especially as I was reading the world of Ben Hur, and I was thinking of the story, as you've uh, noted, the the book, but also the various film adaptations of that. As we're watching that, it, it there's something so compelling because even and even today, you can obtain all things materially, and yet that won't heal the heart. Absolutely. You know, Ben Hur can even realize his, uh, his desire for, for revenge and still come up feeling empty. Uh, all of, uh, all of these, these goals we set for ourselves apart f- from Christ are really um, illusory. And they're not going to win us the satisfaction we want. Uh, you know, today, we, so many people ha- just spend their lives chasing this butterfly of fulfillment. They don't quite know what they want, but they have this notion that they'll know it when they feel it. You know, oh, I haven't found the right job for me yet, so I just keep quitting all the jobs I have because I want to feel fulfilled. Well, I have news for you. You're not going to feel fulfilled this side of heaven. All of that nagging sense of unfulfillment that you have will only be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. If you experience any fulfillment this side of heaven, know that it's just a sample of heavenly glory. Fulfillment that some people experience in marriage is just a shadow of heavenly glory. It's a sacrament of heavenly glory. All of the things that we that we experience as um, as satisfying here on earth are um, are just glimmers of the ultimate satisfaction that we're going to know in Jesus Christ if we persevere, if we endure, if we correspond to the graces that God wants wants to lavish on us. Now, even understanding the world of Ben Hur and that that experience and entering into that that work whether it be by the literature or by the film it it really is a tremendous example of evangelization because of the spectacle because of the the depth of the story it will bring in so many people who are they I mean they're not necessarily like General Lou Wallace, they, they weren't looking to fashion or work or to be entertained by something that would lead them into, into Christianity, and yet that's exactly what it has done for so many people. Well, and it, that's what's exciting about being able to go and to be able to experience it. And it, it, there have been other times, and like you, I haven't had the opportunity to see the film yet, but there have been adaptations of the past of great works that have not always hit the mark. You know, they, they've kind of <laughs> yeah. I, I mean that 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 uh, that is that is true, and it may be the case here too. We won't know until we see it. So so I'm excited to to witness it and see if it it lives up to uh, lives up to expectations and lives up to the heritage of this particular story. But that's that's the real encouragement, isn't it? I mean, to be able to seek out uh, those types of works that even in the last couple hundred years that we've had of, of, of novels and literature that have inspired and touched hearts to go back to those classics. And it enter is. into and, and Ben Hur is a kind of classic. I, I mean, nobody makes a claim that it's a um, that it's a phenomenal work of literature. 
it's more like a cultural monument. It's a work of devotional mm. literature, but it's it's rather remarkable that a work of devotional literature could sell so many millions of copies and could inspire so many different generations of dramatists and filmmakers. It just keeps coming back. It's it's an amazing thing. I, I, again, I cannot think of another story that's like this in its ability to inspire. Now, I'm going to throw out a, a, it's going to seem like an odd question to you, Mike, but you have really come to know the fathers of the church like nobody else I really know. And I mean, in all their personalities and how they've reached out and touched. And they used many different types of means to touch the hearts of those of, of those they were shepherding. I mean, yes, they did strong homilies, and yes, they, they may have written, but they also used song. They used whatever type of means to communicate the message. Can you imagine the fathers of the church? I mean, what kind of novels they might have written or stories they might have put together for us? Well, I can, I can do more than imagine it. I can go and read it. Uh, it the, the interesting thing is that, um, that with the, once Christianity became legal, uh, there were opportunities for these things. And, and then, you know, you started to see the great poets converting to Christianity. And then you have the emergence of great Christian poets like Paulinus of Nola, who's one of the fathers of the church, and Prudentius, who really set a bar, set a set, Prudentius really set out to tell the stories of the martyrs with all the drama uh, and the, the lives of the saints, the life of Jesus Christ through his poetry. Now, that was uh, the medium of choice at that time. And he was a famous poet. He was a best-selling poet. So it was, again, taking advantage of the uh, the the, the uh, the means of entertainment, uh, the media they, that the Christians had at their disposal, and making the most of it. So yeah, I can imagine the, the fathers doing it because I know that the fathers did it, and I've read their works of literature. It's a beautiful thing to watch it happen. You you mentioned the witness of the martyrs, and it, you know, it, going back into the the world of Ben Hur, that that era in Roman history and Judean history, that was such. I mean, here here it is, the modern means of entertainment, and it was gruesome to the <laughs> extreme, and yet even God found a way to break through to touch hearts. It, it's a horrific way, we think, but what an extraordinary way, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it, it really was. It, it's another one of those instances of God taking something that was terrible, you know, and it had, had a lot of momentum. Uh, Roman entertainment was a bloody and brutal thing, and it was it was uh, spectacular. You know, the problem with violent entertainment is that people get used to it. They get inured to it. They get bored by it, and you always have to be um, increasing the level of blood, the level of gore, the level of violence. And so Roman entertainment became increasingly spectacular. Uh, over over the years, and increasingly violent. You know, the, they 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 would set up these battles, uh, and even sea battles, where they would flood the amphitheater and bring in boats so that um so that people could could fight with real swords in front of them and kill each other. Um, this was what you did for your your son on his birthday. You know, you took him out to watch people kill other people, and watch animals kill people, and watch people kill animals. And the more gore, the better. Um, what what I like about um about Ben-Hur is that it, um, it, it really does um, portray that world very vividly. You know, it shows, shows that world in all its violence, in all its brutality, and it helps us to understand what kind of a culture that, that, that made and, um, and what kind of a culture that reflected. Uh, still, as you say, God took even that, even the spectacles, even the games, even the violence, and turned it toward good. Because when those people watched the meekness of the Christians, their willingness to die, they saw a courage that was lacking everywhere else in their experience, everywhere else in uh, their neighborhood, everywhere else in their neighbors, everywhere else in their heart. And they knew it. And it attracted them to Christianity. You know, we look at so many of the, the early Christians, like Justin, who was living in Rome, and uh, and when he tells his story, he said that one of the key moments on his road to conversion was witnessing the martyrdom of Christians and seeing their courage and seeing that they 
had something that they were willing to die for. And if they had something to die for, you know, they had something that they were living for. And, and Justin envied that in them, and he wanted that for himself. Well, Mike, I absolutely love the world of Ben-Hur. I encourage people to pick up a copy because it is so much more, as I said earlier, than an accompaniment on the film that you, you may, at first glance, you might think, oh, if I don't see the movie or not. No, it's much more than that because it's it's a, it's a so steeped in history of, of the place, the times you get to feel. And, and for many of us, we know these characters. As you said, we've, if you haven't seen the, the film, I don't think you've watched television or gone to a, a cinema. <laughs> and I, I, you know, you, you can't help it but be touched by it. But that even aside, it's, it's, it just places you in, in that experience. And you realize there, there really isn't that much new under the sun that you could almost see those same people, the same characters here today in our world. Well, thank you, Chris. I wanted the book to give people that imaginative entry into the first century, and I'm glad that it worked for you. Mm. Mike, any final thoughts? I think it, it's, um, it's, it's a good moment for us, you know, right now. With this movie hitting the big screens, um, it's a moment when we can s kind of seize the conversation about uh, this item of popular culture and uh, use it as a starting point to talk about our own relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe our own conversion, uh, and our own experience of, of, um, of, of the wider culture and, uh, and even the, the, the similarities between our wider culture and the culture of Rome. You know, we can wonder about, about where our society is going and where uh, it might go if it catches that momentum. Uh, that that comes with faith in Christ. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a it's an important cultural moment. It's a good opportunity for us to evangelize. But you know what, Chris? Everything presents us with a good opportunity for evangelize. For for everything presents us with a good opportunity for evangelization if we're looking for it, if we're praying for it, if we're open to the grace. Amen, my dear friend. Beautifully said, Mike Aquilina. Thank you so very much. Thanks again for having me, Chris. It's always good to talk. With Mike Aquilina, we've gone inside the pages of The World of Ben-Hur. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com, the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute Press, or you can obtain it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this discussion along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of DiscerningHearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join me next time for Inside the Pages, Insights from Today's Most Compelling Authors.